Folks, for the first time in history on The Chosen Journey, we have our first guest. And what a guest we got here with Steve Carsey, Big Money Grip, the one, the only Scott Farrell. Scotty B, welcome to The Chosen Journey. Hey, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. And, you know, I haven't seen Steve in so many years or talked to him in so many years. I'm excited to be here. I guess yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. This is absolutely nuts. The fact that you guys played together over 20 years ago, and this is the first time you're reuniting. Oh, yeah. Over 30 years, really, I think, Steve, right? Yeah. I agree 100%. It's about yeah. 30 years ago. I was drafted in 1990, and you were 91, correct? Yeah, yep. Now, to be honest, I was 89, then 90 again. So Gotcha, gotcha. Yep, so we're both drafted the same year. So the way this came to be, Mr. Scotty B, goes like this. We're taping an episode of The Chosen Journey, talking about Steve's baseball journey and the talking about life journeys and what's going on currently in baseball life. Like A bit of everything just comes up into it. And we were talking about the St. Catharines Blue Jays, and you should have seen his eyes light up when he mentions your name near the end of one episode. And I say to myself, I'm going to find this man and we're getting him on here for sure. And once you and I connected through social media, I started playing the, the guessing game with Steve and I asked him, who do you think I found? You know what names he came up with? Chris Winky, probably. No. Uh, Howard Battle. Howard Battle, Howard Battle. Carlos Delgado. Try Ricky Henderson. <laughs> Hey, hey, he went big time, huh? He went for big time. Hall of Famer. Well, he put he put you in a very high class category. I, I appreciate he really, it. He really did. And uh, Jonathan, tell him what exactly you said to me when you said you were bringing Scotty on. I said, he, he names me a few names. I said, those are good names, but bigger, bigger. He says to me, it's got to be Derek Jeter. I said, no, it's not Derek Jeter, but I'm telling you it's better. And then he says to me, it's got to be Ricky Henderson. I said, Steve, I'm not Jesus, okay? I don't have magical powers. I can bring Ricky from the sky for you. But believe it or not, based on this man's accomplishments, I'm going to say better. I like that, Jonathan. I like that. I appreciate it. I don't know if I'm bigger and better, but I like the compliment, complimentary words you, you, you use for me. Thank you. I definitely gotta... said in the class of Derek Jeter. He did say that, I promise. <laughs> And for the still matter is there's so many parallels between you two in as far as your careers, where they started, where they went, where, where, where you were you after your playing careers. And I said, you know what, we, this, this the journey in itself, Steve was very much, Steve's the one who named this the chosen journey. I wanted to call it uh, the, the Steve Carsey baseball story. He said, no, this is about my journey. It's about everybody's journey. And if there's a person who's lived a journey, it's you, Scott. Yeah, yeah, I, we lived, we all do, like Steve said, but yeah, I lived a different journey, and uh, I had a couple paths to take when I uh, played professional sports, but I, I, I enjoyed my time playing baseball, though, definitely did. And we're sort of going to touch upon that, and we got an agenda here, and that's going to go into topic number one, but I got to ask you first and foremost, that big money grip nickname, do you recall it? Oh, yeah, hey, he was a bonus baby, hey. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first and Howard Battle said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, he was he was a bonus baby by, by that time. Um, but you no, know, he came with a big rep and he he threw hard. He was a great pitcher. And I it was, I loved even I played one year with him with Steve, but I love watching him grow and, and see him progress through the big leagues and, and, and play on different teams. I I because I kept in touch and watched all the guys I played with, and I love to see their success. Well, not only did you guys play together, you roomed together. Yeah, we were roommates. We were roommates. That was my first year playing, his first year playing, and we were roommates with Scott Brown. That's right. There were plenty of guys in that house. I think we were in the basement, and there's a total of seven guys. A couple guys were a little bit older. We yeah. would walk to the park, which was very close in St. Catharines. And, you know, just, again, had the opportunity uh, to spend some time with Scotty and then, again, follow his journey uh, through baseball. And then when he was done playing baseball, uh, and made the choice to go and play basketball and had a tremendous career playing basketball, played with some great teams, some great players. And uh, I think we definitely want to hear about that uh, as we get into this. Oh, definitely, definitely. So jumping in first and foremost is obviously, you know, your parallels as far as where you started off in, in professional sports. Uh, Scott being drafted in the first round originally 
uh, not signing with, with the Mariners and then coming back and going with the Jays. Uh, Steve being drafted in the first round by the Jays, ending up together in St. Catharines. I got to ask you first and foremost, you know, your first time in Canada, first time in St. Catharines, I assume, when getting drafted? Oh, yeah, first time. And, and you know, it, it's it's different because being from, you know, I was from Hamlin, Connecticut. You really don't have it. I haven't left that town by that time. And then you go to a different country where your friends can't really get there that easy. It, it was tough for me at first. Um, and plus, because I knew I had basketball coming up at UConn in the, right after baseball was over. So I kind of looked forward to it. But at the same time, I love playing baseball, but I never gave it a 100% chance to be as good as I could have been. Was the game plan, did you say to yourself, I'm going to be the next Danny Ainge? Did you think I'm going to be a modern day, you know, Bo Jackson as far as the two sport type of player? What, what was it going through your mindset? Did you think you were going to end up going one or the other right away? Or did you no, think you were going to stay with both? I never knew how good I was in basketball. I knew I was a pretty good pitcher in baseball because I threw hard. And anyone who throws hard has a chance to be successful. Um, but I didn't know how good I was in basketball until my junior year in college when Coach Cowan told me a lot of school, a lot of teams have been calling me about you. And, and plus, I had other guys before me who got drafted in basketball. So then I started getting more confidence, confidence in, it, in it. But I thought I'd be, I'd be playing baseball for a long time until those days when I, I knew scouts were looking at me for basketball. Steve, what was your first impression of Scott as far as a person? And where did you see him going his trajectory in baseball? Uh, obviously, he's a tremendous person. Look where he's at in life now. Um, <clears throat> he's accomplished a lot of things, you know, and meeting guys for the first time, like Scotty says, when you go away from home, uh, it, it's really tough. Uh, you know, I, when I signed, my scout picked me up. We jumped to LaGuardia Airport, jumped on a puddle jumper, and I met the team in Auburn, New York. Uh, and the next thing I know, my scout drops me off. Doug Alt is our manager. He's like, here you go. You're on your own now. And mm -hmm. then you know, the time comes where you start meeting people, you, you, then you just have connections with people, you know, whether it's baseball, basketball, or just life in general, when you meet people for the first time, and then you kind of hang out, you kind of have some similarities, and you kind of understand who they are, and then you just grow a bond with people, and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, Scotty has done that throughout his life, and in, in both sports, I've done it in baseball, uh, and I think we've both done it off the field, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard at first. I, I had any kid who's 18, 19, 20, 21 years old going into an environment that they're not really accustomed to or used to and haven't been out of their, you know, area very much uh, and a different country, as Scotty said, it can be tough. So it was really nice to, to bond with Scotty, to have a roommate uh, that was from the East Coast and kind of just know kind of people, have a people person and, and, and grow together, even though it was for a short time. Hey, Jonathan, no, no, nothing that's kind of crazy about baseball. What's that? It, especially when you're drafted. Each person, we all play for the Blue Jays, but each person is an individual because we're all trying to make it to big leagues, no matter who, what someone else on your team does. It's really you trying to be the best person you can be, regardless, regardless if your team scores runs, regardless if your team hits, regardless of other pitchers pitch well. It, so it's kind of a, an individual sport at that time until you make, the, to make it to the big leagues. So it's, it's totally different than playing other sports. And, and when you're young, that's kind of because you've never been in that situation before. Everything's a team, team, team. But when you play minor league baseball, it's I got to be successful. I need to do my best. I need to uh, make the best pitch every time I, I, I throw a pitch to the plate. And it's, it's totally different than playing any other team sport until you make it to the big leagues, I would think. Well, let me ask you, I mean, you were a first round draft pick, you know, deciding not to go and you still end up going to baseball. When you first met Big Money Grip, what was your first impression of Steve? And tell us now the dirt. What was he really like as a roommate, please? No, he was a good, real good guy. <laughs> um, and, and I was, like, I like learning from everyone, high school, college players. And one thing I saw, one thing I noticed about Steve, how strong he was, especially his legs, his lower body. You could tell he ran a lot. You could tell he, um, he used his legs a lot to pitch. He was a strong, strong young fellow. So that's why, I, I, and I was really skinny. So I was like, wow, he had, he's getting a lot of power from his legs, his hips, his butt. I need to work on, my, on some things to get stronger, bigger and stronger. And he flew with, he threw with such ease and that ball came out and just popped with such ease. And, you know, watching other people play and, and learning from them, it, it was, I, I love that part about sports. And was he no, a good no, 
And I think off the field, we are both young 18 year olds. Steve, what are you, 50, 50 now? 50, you got it. Now I'm 51. So we were both young to try to, try to survive and try to figure out life. So um, we had good times, but we, 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 we hung out a little bit, but we were young. So we were just trying to survive in Canada and, and learn about how to, how, to, how to grow in baseball. So Steve showing you, you know, as what he was about, where, where, I'm going to ask you the same question. Where did you see him heading at that point? When you're in St. Catharines watching a young Steve Carsey, where did you imagine his, his career was going to go? I, I knew Steve was tracking to the big leagues quickly. Um, like I said, he had a nice, cur great curveball, a lot of pop on his fastball. And like, I'm not sure if Steve did it, but I love learning from some of the guys we play with the college kids, learning a change up, um, maybe a knuckle curves, learning different things to make us better. And I knew Steve was going to do that because he already had his fastball and curveball down, but other things he was going to put in his repertoire and, and get better. And, and like, like, like we all know, First round picks get a little more chances to make it. So me and Steve had had our chances to make it easier than a lot of guys. So um, we just got to go there and do it. But Steve going directly, you getting drafted that first time around, first round draft pick and saying, nah, I'm going to pass. I'm going to college. What was the mindset? Was it hard to turn it down? And was there ever any regrets at that point? It wasn't hard to turn down because uh, Seattle was hard to, to negotiate with. So it wasn't hard to turn down. I think the only regret I might have is how far could I have gone in baseball if I put 100% of effort into it instead of playing only three months a year? Because I would only play three months a year because I, mm -hmm. I went to college. So I never got my arm strong enough. Um, I was, we were on pitch limits. So I never really don't know how good I could have been in baseball. And I don't have a regret. You just have a wonder or a thought of how good you could have been. Well, as far as your, your, uh, your fellow athletes and your teammates, when you made the decision, I mean, Looking at the stats, you know, you get an introductory to baseball. Then that second season, you really took off. With those numbers, they were good numbers for, for a young player to just walk away at that point. How did teammates react? They may try to talk you out of it, or did everybody understand? No, because you after once you it's ba like I said, baseball is different. Like you just don't see anybody anymore, you know, because you really didn't build that. Because guys will be cut. Guys will be. I remember days of guys would be pink slips. Remember pink slips, Steve? The yeah, locker. they put them in your locker. They That's put them in your locker. Thing. Guys would be cut that day, so you really didn't talk to them that much. Um, but so you really didn't build a, 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 like I said, a huge bond with. I mean, I knew Steve because he was my roommate. But with other guys, you really didn't have a huge bond with them. Only time you really hung out with them was when you're on the road or something. When we all <laughs> we all stayed in the same hotel because we didn't. There was no money from the found, from the in the minor league, so everybody was like three or four guys in a room. Well, there's a lot of clicks, right? I yeah. mean, you have a lot of different variables with a lot of, you know, Latin players coming over who hang out together. You have the American guys hanging out together, um, you know, and then you have the guys who grew up in certain areas that they kind of just bond and hang out together too. And that's, I think, kind of where uh, in basketball, it's a little bit different, right? You have 12 players. It's a little bit more close knit. You're at practice every day. Uh, you know, obviously there's not too many foreign players. There are some, yeah. um, you know, but the language barrier isn't too, too much different yeah. as opposed to baseball. You have 25 guys, you're trying to, you know, figure out the different guys and you're trying to go out there and, and compete the best that you can and, and, and try to do the best you can, even though you're in a team environment. Yeah, that is so true. I mean, there, there were a lot of clicks. I mean, different positions, um, different races, different ethnicities, um, language barriers. There are a lot of clicks on baseball. That is so true. I'm thinking now back to that timing that you guys are saying now, and you're saying 30 years ago, there's pros and cons of having played in that era. Pro being nobody has social media. Nobody's got phones and cameras <laughs> around. So whatever's going on stays going on and boys will be boys and everybody has fun, etc. cetera. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you as a youngster going to hotels, getting autographs, I've seen a lot of stuff you wouldn't see today. Yes. So that's nice as far as privacy goes. But on the other hand, if you think about it, like now when you're meeting people and you're connecting the way Scott and I connected, you know, in social media, connect, talk, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, you guys don't have these cell phones where you're texting each other or connecting through social media, seeing what everybody's about. So it's a lot easier to separate and stay separated. Whereas maybe an advantage would have been if you, if you'd had the technology back then, maybe you would have kept better connection. That's for sure. We definitely would have uh, kept in touch more because it's like you said, social media, brings people together. It's, people use it for good reasons. Some other people use it for bad reasons. But obviously you can use it for good reason and it keeps you connected, keeps you updated with people. Um, but also, like you said, 
I love the privacy that we had back in the day. The social media, if we played with a lot of social media and camera phones everywhere, it would be a totally different story uh, the way we grew up. So even though even when you guys are playing in, in your rookie season, I don't even know if there's really flip phones at that point. I think there's like the Zach Morris cell phone, you know, maybe or the or car the brick. Or, or yeah, the, the car brick. phone. Yeah, the brick. Yeah. But there was no cell phones back then. So you guys really got to play. And and you know, it's uh because it's amazing now. You go back and look footage for both of you from your rookie seasons and from early on in your careers. There's less stuff out there because there weren't people snapping pictures every two seconds at arenas and stadiums. But it's VHS, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it's essentially what you had. I used to look at tapes in '93 when I got to the big leagues on VHS, and you know now it's so much more digitalized that you can just go on there. I'm sure it's the same thing. I mean, you know, Scott, you're coaching basketball, right? So you can kind of put it on digital and you can kind of show the different moves or the different positions you need to be on the basketball court. And we do that with baseball too. Now, uh, when I was coaching the last three years with the Brewers before stepping down, uh, you know, it's so easy to get the information and get all of the knowledge that we couldn't get 30 years ago. And I promise you 30 years ago, if we had the information that we had today, all of us would have been a lot better at our craft because we could have honed it in a little bit better because we were working basically off coach's eyes and off a field and we weren't working off of you know being able to slow down the video to a microsecond to see what position your body's in to throw a baseball true and, and one, another thing too for for selfish reasons our brands will be so much bigger i mean today's day and age the athlete's brand is, is, is might be number one to all these all these young guys now and our brand will be bigger um we'd be more of household names if we, if we played back in those days, back uh, in this era. But, you know, but I, like I said, I like the privacy. I'm sure Steve liked his privacy a little bit more too. Um, but today's considering brain, he's off social media still completely, I would say he does. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just a little bit more old school, right? I mean, yeah. you don't grow up with it. Uh, and now, you know, it's around, I mean, I, you flirt with, you st I still get Twitter because I get updates on baseball and all of that so I can pop on it. I'm just not physically on it, to trolling around and toting around to, to kind of find things. But I get a lot of my information off of that and I need to decipher that in, 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 in especially in the baseball world or, or the sports world. And that's how Steve and I originally connected. I was baseball blogging over a decade ago and as Steve was starting to, to wind down the career and then going into uh, minor league coaching, and we connected up for that two seconds that he was actually active on Twitter as far as actually appearing on there. And otherwise, he's completely stayed off social media, no presence whatsoever until this, this series started. And uh, one of the things, you know, uh, we talked about having the journey and talking about Steve's story is I told him, you have a legacy where your kids, your grandkids, they need a place to hear the stories and hear what your career is about. It's really nice to leave that at the end of the day. That is true. And like you said, blogs and stuff like this, our kids will see it and uh, and learn more about the guys I played with, the, the guys that Steve played played with, and and and, and understand our journey, uh, what we did, how, what people thought of us, and it, it, that, that that's exciting.